Good afternoon and happy Sabbath. It's wonderful to be back here in the house of the Lord. It's, it's been a few weeks since we've uh, been away, as there are many that are traveling uh, through this holiday time period, and we pray that everyone is safe and um, that they are enjoying the blessings of the Lord and that God is keeping everyone in health. And so we are uh, blessed to be here with you this particular Sabbath day. Want to invite you to pray um, as we open the Word of God. Want to ask that we would kneel as far as possible as we open the Scriptures together. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for creating in us clean hearts. For you spake and it was done, you commanded and it stood fast. You are the Lord that speaks righteousness, you declare things that are right. And Jesus further said, now are ye clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. And we know that your word does not return void. It will accomplish that which you please and it will prosper in the thing whereto you send it. And so we pray that you would rain down righteousness upon us. We pray for the transforming power of your Holy Spirit to bring a heavenly influence in this place. And that the word preach would profit us being mixed with faith in them that hear it. We thank you for Jesus, the greatest gift that you could ever bestow upon humankind. In fact, all of heaven was poured out in that precious, unspeakable gift of your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we thank you and we praise you for that which you are doing and what you will do as you've promised to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of our message is The Three Watchers and the Advent. Three Watchers and the Advent. As we recognize that we are living at the end of time, that we are living upon whom the ends of the world are come, in order for us to be ready for Christ's second coming, in which we read the verse that says that he will appear the second time without sin unto salvation, because we understand that Christ came to this earth the first time to take away sin. We know that in the sanctuary above, he is continuing his ministry of doing a work of reconciliation and an atonement in order to blot out sin. And once sins are blotted out, once the plan of salvation and redemption has been consummated and experienced in the church of the living God, then we know that Christ will come back to claim us as his own, especially when his character is perfectly reproduced in his people. But we want to look back to the first advent of Christ, because there are many lessons that will help the church in these last days to be ready for his appearing, especially as we look at three main classes of individuals that were not only prepared for his first advent, but were actually proclaiming and helping to swell that cry regarding his first advent. And so the three classes of watchers that we'll be looking at are the shepherds of Bethlehem, also the wise men, they came from the east, and then also the prophets Simeon and Anna. And in the Bible, there actually are three watches that are connected to Christ's coming. When we look in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 35 to 38, Scripture tells us that there are three watches that God's people are to go through. And out of those three watches, which is the watch that Christ actually appears? 
Is it the first watch? The second watch? Or perhaps the third? Which watch does Christ come? He doesn't come in the first. He doesn't come in the second or the third. But he comes in the fourth watch according to Matthew 14 verse 25. And of course those three watches that Luke 12 talks about definitely correspond to the first, second, and third angel's messages. Now I'm not going to preach that today. Since that falls under the category of the parables, I'll let Pastor Sankey deal with that at another time. I'm just simply setting the table and preheating the oven, but I'll go ahead and let him bake the bread, divide it, and then serve it to the people. So I want us to begin in the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke, what chapter are we going to? Going to the book of Luke chapter 2 and beginning here in verse number 6 again, looking at the three watchers of the advent. These three watchers uh, give us the formula, give us the characteristics as to what should be seen, what should be realized by those that are also anticipating the final advent, the second coming of Christ in power and in great glory. And of course, those that are going to receive Jesus as he appears the second time without sin unto salvation also must be without sin as well. Which, of course, that is what he is doing now in the sanctuary above in the most holy place, doing a work to cleanse the sanctuary from the record books of sins and also to cleanse God's people from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit that they may perfect holiness in the fear of God. We look in Luke chapter 2 and verse 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And so we look at this first group of watchers dealing with the shepherds. The shepherds, we're going to see from the Bible, are going to represent those that are doing the work of an evangelist, those that are gospel workers, those that are engaged in ministry, not just simply in the church, but even beyond the walls of church as well. We find that they were abiding in the field and they were keeping watch over the flocks by night. And as a result of abiding in the field and doing the work that God had called them to do as watchmen, that the angels came to them and delivered unto them the greatest news and tidings that had ever preceded this time of the world's history regarding the birth of Christ and even where he should be found and the signs and wonders that would follow. They were blessed to receive these tidings of 
great joy and peace and goodwill uh, towards men and all the earth, and the earth was lightened with its glory, and they were able to receive and to share and to proclaim in that glory. In the book of Isaiah 56, we find in the Bible the description of what a shepherd is. Now, of course, I'm not going to take the time to list out every detail in the Bible regarding a shepherd because we would not only get through this message, but, I mean, we could study this for eternity, and we will. But Isaiah 56, verses uh, 10 and 11, just wanted to give you some verses regarding the work of these shepherds who had the privilege of being able to proclaim the angels' messages regarding the tidings of good things regarding Christ's birth because they were doing the work. They were in the field. They were protecting and keeping the flock by night. In Isaiah 56, beginning in verse 10, it says, His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his gain from his quarter. And so you can see here that in verse number 10, the watchmen that are described therein are also called shepherds. In the Bible, a shepherd is a watchman. And we see in Luke chapter 2 that they were keeping watch over their flocks by night. So definitely not necessarily a work of ease or work of convenience, but self-sacrificing love. They were, of course, on call 24-7, and at night, I'm, I'm sure that it had its challenges and its difficulties. Night, of course, in the Bible is dealing with a couple of things. Could be dealing with apostasy. Uh, could be dealing with a time when no man can, can work or when probation is closed, but the shepherds were out there in the field keeping watch because they are watchmen. Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel chapter 34, beginning here in verse number 1, once again describing what shepherds do from the Bible, and of course with the reproof, with the correction from the Lord for the negligence of their work and of their ministry. The Bible tells us here in the book of Ezekiel 34, beginning in verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat, and you clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. The diseased have you not strengthened. Neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty ye ruled them. Now one of the things, or a few things that I want to bring out in this passage regarding the shepherds in verse number 4. Where it is expected of a shepherd to be able to deal with the diseased and the sick that are in the church. Now, of course, this isn't just dealing with spiritual sickness, but also physical sufferings and physical infirmities and maladies as well. And so if they were called upon to heal the disease and, and that which was sick, then obviously there is a ministry of healing that the shepherds should be familiar with. They should understand the principles of health reform, understand the principles of medical missionary work. So understanding that a, a shepherd is not just a watchman, but he's also a medical missionary. Should be understanding disease, its cause, its prevention, and also its cure. They should understand physiology, anatomy, nutrition. We understand that there is a work also to gather that which has gone astray, that which was driven away, to gather them and to bring them back. Now as we look at Ezekiel 34, Jeremiah 23, which is a parallel prophecy to this, gives us another description of what a shepherd is in the Bible. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 23. 
Jeremiah chapter 23. And by the way, it's, it's interesting that if you keep reading in Ezekiel 34, God begins to talk about the judgments that will come upon the shepherds, the punishments that they will face for not being faithful to their charge. That when we look at Ezekiel 34, God talks about removing those shepherds and setting up other shepherds, and he points to Christ as the good shepherd, as the chief shepherd of the flock that will take the reins in his own hands. When we look in Jeremiah chapter 23, again, we're dealing with unfaithful shepherds, and of course, Christ our righteousness is mentioned in this chapter as well of Jeremiah 23. Look at verse number 1 with me, Jeremiah 23 and verse number 1, and we find that just like with Ezekiel 34 and Jeremiah 23, it is the Lord that keeps in check the shepherds. It is the, it is the Lord that ultimately will right all the wrongs that the shepherds have committed against his flock. When we look in Jeremiah 23 verse 1, it says, Woe be unto the pastors that do destroy and uh, that destroy rather, and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, you have scattered my flock, and driven them away, and have, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase." And I will shut, set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. And then in verse 5 and, and 7 talks about the arrival of Christ the Lord, our righteousness. But another term for shepherd in the Bible is a pastor or a minister. A pastor and a shepherd are synonymous. And this is why Jesus was, of course, a shepherd. David was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. You find that a lot of the, the training and the preparatory process for someone being a great leader in Israel was to attend the sheep, was to look after the flock. A work of visitation, work of the ministry of healing, a, a work of feeding the flock with knowledge and with understanding. And also we find in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Excuse me, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Go with me, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. If the shepherds are to be feeding the flock with knowledge and with understanding, well, what is the basis of that knowledge and understanding? In fact, the shepherds that were announcing the birth of Christ and seeing if what the angels said came to pass, where did they get their doctrine from? We find that the shepherds got their doctrine straight from the angels. It was the angels that brought the tidings, that brought the gospel message. And the shepherds also should be connected not only with heavenly angels, but also the angels in Revelation 14 that make up the everlasting gospel. That is what the flock needs at this time. The truth for this time. The sanctifying influence of that truth, that which is designed to sanctify and to strengthen and to gather God's people at this time. The book of Ecclesiastes 12 and verse number 9. Shepherds are watchmen. Shepherds are medical missionaries. Shepherds are pastors and ministers. They represent a people that are involved in the work of the ministry. Ecclesiastes 12.9 it says, And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge, yea, he gave good heed, and he sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as golds and as nails, fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. So a shepherd is a preacher. A shepherd is a Bible student. He studies the Bible so that he could teach the people knowledge and 
understanding. And the Bible talks about the tools that the shepherd or that the preacher has. It talks about the words of the wise are as golds or as nails. And with nails and with golds, these are used in order to build up something. Now we know that shepherds are watchmen. We know they're pastors. We know that they're preachers and students of the word. But are they also builders as well? I want you to go with me to the book of Isaiah once again. Isaiah, this time we're going to Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44, and beginning in verse 24, as we are dealing with these principles here with the shepherds, these are the first class of individuals that were able to discern the glad tidings of the advent of Christ. And for those of us that are preparing for his second advent, one of the best ways is to be a shepherd, is to be a watchman, is to be involved in ministry and missionary labors and doing the work of an evangelist. Not just simply the clergyman or the ordained minister in the desk, but this, of course, speaks of God's people as a whole, as he has called his church to be watchmen and light bearers in these last days of earth's history. Isaiah 44, 24, it says here, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah ye shall be built. And I'll raise up the decayed places thereof that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers, that saith of Cyrus, He is my what? My shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be what? Built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. And so we find that Cyrus, who by the way was not a Jew, was not a, a Hebrew, or was not born or raised as a, as a seven-day Adventist, the Bible says that Cyrus was his shepherd. And that Cyrus was going to say to Jerusalem, You shall be built, and also regarding the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. And so we know that he played a prominent role in prophecy. And his work and his role and mission was described over a hundred years before his birth. And Cyrus is his, is his shepherd. And of course, shepherds build up. The Bible says that he would build up Jerusalem. We know that Cyrus did a great work in delivering and rescuing God's people out of Babylonian captivity. And we know that he is a type of Christ as well. It is Christ that's actually appointing Cyrus. For the word Cyrus means the one that comes from the sun rising. Or from the east and from the north, as it were. Very interesting that Cyrus would be used to build up Jerusalem. Why is building up Jerusalem so important? Because the Bible tells us, Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion. For the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. For her servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and the kings of the earth his glory. When the Lord shall have built up Zion, what will he do? Finish the rest. He shall appear in his glory. Amen. So the appearing of Christ in glory has to be connected to, cannot be accomplished without Zion or Jerusalem being built up. And where do we see this final work taking place? Isaiah 58. Go with me to Isaiah 58. Isaiah, what chapter are we going to? Isaiah 58. So shepherds are watchmen, medical missionaries, Pastors, ministers, gospel workers, Bible workers, evangelists, call porters, Bible students, people that labor with souls in word and in doctrine, 
And in doing this work, they're building up Zion. And the streets and the walls, even in troublous times. Isaiah 58, verse 12 says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repair of the breach, the restore of paths to dwell in, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, for the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, and not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I'll cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord have spoken it. This is the final work that must be done before the Lord can appear in his glory. This is why it's so important, the work of the shepherd to build the old waste places, to raise up the foundations of many generations, to repair the breach, be the restorer past dwelling through the work of the third angel's message and the final Sabbath reform, which is dealing with the controversy over the seal of God and also the mark of the beast. This work must be done before Christ can appear in his second advent. But you had the shepherds in the field during his first advent doing this work. And that's why they were some of the first evangelists entrusted to give the glad tidings. But they weren't the only ones. In fact, Matthew chapter 2. Turn with me, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. The first watchers were the shepherds. These are the evangelists. These are the Bible workers. These are the ministers. These are the medical missionaries. These are the front line men that God sends forth to, clear, to carry these glad tidings. But in Matthew chapter 2, we find another class of watchers, beginning in verse 1. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Why would I can understand why Herod would be troubled. He was, he was threatened because there was a rival king. One that was heir apparent to the throne of Israel. But why would Jerusalem be troubled at the tidings of the advent? Did they not know? Weren't they not expecting the arrival of the Messiah? The Bible says in verse number 4, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is thus written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art thou not least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So they had the scrolls. They had the scriptures. They had the prophecies. Well, then why did God have to call wise men from the east, non-Hebrews, Gentile believers, to come and proclaim this message? Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. Why did God have to use Gentiles to proclaim a message that Israel should have been, should have been on the front lines proclaiming? It's because they did not truly believe. And at this time period, the idea of a Messiah being born was a fanatical excitement. Nobody, hardly anybody's mind was really on the arrival or the birth of Christ. But God will not leave himself without witnesses. And if he can't get his own church to do it, then he'll get believers outside of his church to proclaim the advent. Now they said, we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now understand, these weren't astrologers, these weren't stargazers or idolaters or heathen, even though they were not Jews. What did they mean that we have seen his star in the east and we're coming to worship him? Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Why are you so silent? 
Why are you not giving the trumpet a certain sound? This is the greatest news of all time. And why are you quiet? It's because they did not believe. And the Bible tells us regarding where these wise men from the east got their information from. Let's go to the book of Numbers chapter 24. Numbers what chapter? Numbers chapter 24. These wise men, these magi that came from the east were highly intelligent individuals. These were men that understood mathematics, they understood science, they understood nature. They also studied Bible prophecy as well. And one of the prophecies that they studied were in the writings of Moses by the prophet Balaam. Now we know that in Numbers chapter 24, Balaam was called or hired by Balak, king of Moab, to curse the people of God, but instead of cursing them, that curse was turned to a blessing. The Holy Spirit overrided the desires of Balaam who loved the wages of unrighteousness and his heart went after covetousness and he was trying to curse them but the Lord put a word in his mouth and instead of uttering curses it was blessings and there were three attempts by Balaam to curse the people of God but each time it was turned into a blessing. You see that in Numbers 23, there's one blessing, two blessing, three blessing, and then in Numbers 24, there's a fourth blessing. And those three blessings that Balaam proclaimed also point to the first, the second, and also the third angel. But which blessing describes the coming of the Messiah? Not the first, not the second. Not the third, but under the fourth. Because it's in the fourth watch, or after the fourth message, that Christ comes to the earth. Numbers 24, verse 14, it says, And now, behold, I go unto my people, come therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a what? star out of Jacob and a scepter shall arise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. This was the prophecies, one of the prophecies that the wise man studied. And it's interesting that Balaam himself was also not a Hebrew. Anyone know where Balaam, his home country was from? He wasn't a Jew, but he was also, he was a, a prophet to Israel, but he wasn't a Jew. Where is he from? Silence falls upon the congregation, waiting in anticipation for the answer. Let's go to Deuteronomy 23. Let's see where is Balaam from. Wouldn't be the first time that God used someone that was not necessarily born an Israelite. Because the good tidings were for all people, not just for the Jews. And the reason is, is because the Jews weren't even excited. They weren't even, weren't zealous to even want to proclaim the arrival of their own Messiah. Is that familiar today? We, we find that our own people don't want to proclaim the three angels' messages, don't want to proclaim the prophecies of the last days do not want to deal with certain subjects that relate to the events connected with the closed probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble. So God will raise up other channels in order to give this message. It's not an Adventist message. It's a message for the world. And the world deserves to hear it. And if, and if God's people want to hold it back, God says, I will raise up other instrumentalities that will give the message. It's our privilege and honor to do so, 
but God will not be left without witness. Look at Deuteronomy 23, beginning in verse number 4. It says, Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth of Egypt, and because they hired against the Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pethor, of where? Mesopotamia to curse thee. Where's Mesopotamia? Where's Mesopotamia? You don't have to be afraid to say it. Where is Mesopotamia? It's Babylon. Where is, where is Abraham from? Our father Abraham. Same place. Like I said, it's not the first time that God will call a people out of Mesopotamia or out of Babylon to proclaim the message. Didn't God do the same with Abraham? How many visitors came to Abraham on the plains of Mamre in Genesis chapter 18 to reveal the future of the destruction of Sodom, which is a type of the end of the world, and also the birth of the Messiah. How many visitors came to him? How many? Three. And the Bible says that God preached the gospel to Abraham, who was in Ur the Chaldees, and he came out of Babylon, and then he became known as an Hebrew, the one from the region beyond, as it were, and he becomes the father of Israel. Balaam as well. The same, God calls him out and allows him to become a messenger for him. Unfortunately, he falls away. But these wise men from the east, it is very probable that they also came from the region of Mesopotamia. And we're also studying the prophecies. We're also receiving the everlasting gospel that the Jewish nation was rejecting and did not want to proclaim because of their alliance with Romanism. And the Bible says these wise men from the east came proclaiming, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen a star in the east. We're coming to worship him. They studied Bible prophecy, and they came and proclaimed the glad tidings. We go back to Matthew chapter 2. The wise men from the east are representing the students of prophecy, not just simply from the church, but even from outside of the church as well. Don't think that other people are not studying the same things that we're studying. Don't think that people don't have the same questions and, and are trying to understand last day events. They're just wishing and hoping that somebody might come and would help them understand the scriptures. That's where we're supposed to come in. But if we're not going to do it, God will send angels to give the messages to them. This is what he always does. And in Matthew chapter 2, we continue on here. Reading in verse number, beginning in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, there, there, there is a little dispute regarding, well, how many wise men were they? Because some would say, well, if there was three, well, that, where do we get three from? That's Catholic. And I would say, well, the understanding of three is not, well, what's so Catholic about the number three? In fact, when we look at the three gifts, it could be implied that there were three wise men. It wouldn't break Scripture because the number three is all throughout the Bible. Those, three wise, those wise men could represent the people that brought the three angels but they're representing the Gentiles that receive that message and then they proclaim it. When God's people are slow to believe that all, what all the prophets have spoken. But that's not necessarily the focus. It says these wise men, when they came, they brought their gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. How many gifts? Three gifts. What do these three gifts, or these heavenly wares, represent? Go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 3. Revelation what chapter? These wise men, these Gentiles that came from the east, that came from Mesopotamia, studied prophecy, received the everlasting gospel, 
They were scientists, they were astronomers, mathematicians, and God used them to come to the glorious holy mountain to deliver the truth that was being muffled, that was being silenced and suppressed because it was seen to be fanaticism. You don't believe what I'm saying? Go back and read, We Have Seen His Star in Desire of Ages. And unfortunately, when we're preaching Daniel and Revelation today, there are many in our ranks that feel like that also is fanaticism. To talk about the close of probation, to talk about the shaking and the sifting, the sealing and the latter rain. These things are fanatical. We shouldn't talk about it. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse number 17, it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me, what? Gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. That's, that's the first gift. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. That's gift number two. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou, that thou mightest see. That's gift number three. The gold, gold tried in fire. The frankincense, the frankincense is a, is, a, is a white smoke or a white cloud that can cover one as a garment of righteousness. When you go back to the sanctuary in Leviticus 16, and on the day of atonement, on the tenth day of the seventh month, when Aaron was about to go into the most holy place, he had to make sure that he was covered with the incense that went before him to cover him that he would not appear in his own righteousness or in his own merits. The frankincense is the white raiment of Christ's righteousness. And then myrrh, the oil of myrrh, is the eye salve which we are to anoint our eyes with. So these magi, these wise men, they studied prophecy. They also represent those that will receive the message of the straight testimony. The gold the frankincense, the myrrh represents the gold, the white remnant, and the eye salve, and they proclaim this. I really don't like these things. And, and they proclaim this message regarding the heavenly wares, regarding the treasures that deal with faith, that deal with righteousness, and deal with the, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And they give these treasures to Christ. They gave these gifts to his parents, which we understand would be used to actually finance Mary, Joseph, and Jesus when they were in Egypt. That's what it was used for, to prepare them for their travels and to sustain them while they were out of Israel. And why would they have to flee? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew what chapter? Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 12. There's two other points we want to bring out before we move on to the third and final class of watchers. Matthew chapter 2 verse 12. And the Bible says, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and, there, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So, of course... Not just going to Egypt as a place of refuge to be sustained, but also to fulfill prophecy as well. But how were these wise men warned? By a dream or by a vision? 
So wait a minute, a dream and a vision? What, what type of dream is this? How, how does God communicate in dreams and visions? What, what does he bestow upon those that he's giving dreams and visions to? What, would you say they were being guided by the spirit of prophecy? Is, is that a stretch? Are you scared to say that or believe in that? Is the spirit of prophecy only for, only for the believers that are in Israel? Notice what Joel chapter 2 has to say. Go to Joel chapter 2. Joel the second chapter and looking together here in verse number 28. Joel chapter 2. In verse 28, some, one of those wise men, some, somebody had the gift of prophecy because God says, if there be a prophet among you, I'll reveal myself to him in a dream or in a vision, according to Numbers 12, 6, and, and 7. So notice Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my what? So what brings on the dreams and the visions for the old men and the young men and the, and the handmaidens? It's his spirit. But he says, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Now, when the Spirit is poured out, what manifestation does the Spirit reveal Himself in when it's poured out? What does that remind you of? Something that's poured out or poured down upon you. Rain, both the former and latter. Look at verse 23 of Joel 2. Joel 2, verse 23. It says here, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for He hath given you the former rain moderately, and He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And so verse 23 is an explanation of verse 28 and 29. So you're talking about these wise men that, that responded to the sure word of prophecy. They responded to the Holy Spirit in the former and the latter rain. They had received the straight testimony, as it were, and they proclaim that message to Jerusalem. Herod is threatened. Herod is troubled. Herod pretends like he wants to worship this child king, but he really wants to destroy him because Herod represents the dragon. He had the spirit of the dragon. And we know that the dragon is always wroth with the woman and goes to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. In all ages, the dragon always tries to kill Christ and the Advent movement. In fact, let's notice in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, as we move on. Matthew 2, 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead with which sought the young child's life. So here Rome, under Herod, tries to kill Jesus. What was it that caused him to kill, want to kill baby Jesus? What was he threatened by? It was Christ's, it was Christ's advent, yes, but the loss of power, okay, yes. But wasn't there a message proclaimed? What was that message? Where is he that's born king of the Jews? We've seen his star where? In the east. And the wise men came from where? So you mean to tell me it was a message from the east that troubled Herod, who represents Rome, king of the north? And, 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 when, and when the king is troubled, what does he go forth to do? 
to utterly go forth and to destroy and make away many. But then what happens? What happens to that king? What happens to Rome? He comes to his end and none helps him. Isn't that what happened to Herod? Did he not come to his end and none helped him? That's just a little parallel between Matthew 2 and Daniel 11. That's not our focal point. But we had to put that in there to show you those tidings out of the east that always troubled the king of the north in all ages. Now, we want to go to Luke chapter 2 as we begin to come to an end. The wise men from the east are representing God's people that are not necessarily in the remnant right now. Many of them are scattered in Babylon. Many are in other denominations, but they're studying prophecy. They're looking for the coming of Christ. They're, they're receptive to the Holy Spirit. God is going to use them to be his messengers when God's people will not lift up their voice like a trumpet. When God's people are like dumb dogs that cannot bark, the Lord will not leave himself without witnesses. They also represent those that received the early and latter rain. They received the straight testimony, thus making them wise virgins. In Luke chapter 2, verse 22. Bible says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 22. And when the days of purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished... They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So here we have an aged man. We have one that was filled with the Spirit and came into the temple by the Spirit. Just as Jesus was being dedicated by the priest. And that priest looked upon Jesus, the King of glory, the Holy One of Israel, the creator of the, of the ends of the earth, as though he was just another child. Didn't even recognize that he was holding Emmanuel, God with us. But again, God was not going to leave himself without witness. At that very time, here comes Simeon, an aged man, a pioneer, as it were, in Israel, with the Holy Spirit upon him. And he was just and devout, and he was waiting, he was looking for the consolation in Israel. And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit revealed unto him that he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Christ. Hold on a second. Who does he represent here? Who are the people that will not taste death? Or not see death, but will live on to see Jesus coming the second time. Simeon is a type of the 144,000 that are filled with the Holy Spirit, that are walking the path of the just, which is as a shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day, who's studying prophecy, who's looking for the consolation of Israel. And is able to discern what the priest was not able to discern. That the Word was made flesh. The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who came to tabernacle amongst us. It says here in, in Luke, going on in Luke chapter 2, in verse 27, and he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, 
Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Notice that it was a light not just for Israel, but for the Gentiles too. Because we've seen that the Lord employed the Gentiles to proclaim this message. And what's interesting is that when you look at Simeon's prophecy here, you can divide it into three, a threefold message. I know what you're saying. You say, man, pa Pastor Taylor is crazy. Every time he looks in the Bible and sees the number three, he always says three angels. Well, you go back and you study it. Go back and study it. Go and taste and see that the Lord is good. It's, it's not my number. It's not my message. It's, it's God's signature. That, that's how you know the message is true. Because it's going to line up with Revelation 14. It's an everlasting gospel. We just have to ask God to open thou mine eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Be able to see what he sees. So notice this. Let's go through this. So I'm going to... I'm going to start here in verse 30 again. Verse 30 says, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared for the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. That's the first message of Simeon. Let's look at the second. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel for a sign that shall be spoken against. This is the second message of Simeon. And now the third. Verse 35, yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That's the third. And what did Simeon mean when he said to Mary, a sword is going to pierce your heart also? Because the Holy Ghost is upon him. This is prophecy that he's speaking here. What sword would pierce Mary's soul? That the thoughts of all hearts may be revealed. Could this not speaking about the crucifixion of her own son? that she would be there to witness. Wouldn't that be as a sword piercing her own soul? To see the son that she raised, and that she taught, and that she birthed. To be lifted up on the cross. For her salvation and the redemption of all. That the thoughts of all men's hearts may be revealed. Were not the hearts of all revealed at the cross? Was not Satan's Thoughts and intents revealed at the cross? Did not the heavenly universe and the angels and everyone who wasn't really sure about what Satan was up to in heaven when that war broke out, did they not now see that he was a murderer? Because he was the one that crucified the Prince of Glory. That third message where the hearts of all are revealed do not just stop at Calvary, but it points to the end of all time and even in the judgment. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm not going to go into detail into this. I'm just going to give you a little pointers here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. The thoughts of all men's hearts were revealed at the cross, and at the cross there is judgment. Who's judged at the cross? The prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is cast down. And in the middle of the cross, how many other people were crucified with Jesus? Two. Both were thieves, right? Both were lawbreakers. But in the midst of the cross, was there not one thief that recognized who Jesus was? And said, Lord, remember me in thy kingdom? Where the other one was continuing to curse him and to rail him? So in the middle of the cross, you have the two thieves. 
And everybody in this room is a thief. We're all thieves. We're all responsible for crucifying the Lord afresh and putting Him to open shame. But there's going to be one class of thieves that will turn to God and say, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom, while the other one will reject Him. You see, in the judgment, the world is divided in two. What divides the believer from the unbeliever is the cross. Judgment. A separation of classes. And we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, the same in 1844 when the cross is repeated again in the great disappointment. There's always two, wise and foolish. Two thieves, two classes. 1 Corinthians 4, and I'm going to begin in verse number 3. 1 Corinthians 4, 3, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of a man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that just judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. So when the thoughts of hearts are manifested, that's a work of judgment. That's a work of investigation. That's a work of separation. So Simeon gives a threefold prophetic message to Mary and Joseph corresponding with Revelation 14, that third message pointing to the cross, pointing to judgment, pointing to when the thoughts of men's hearts would be manifested to see who is a repentant thief and who was an unrepentant thief. And just as Simeon was giving his message, God has another witness come, because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word needs to be established. So Luke chapter 2, let's go back here. Luke 2, in verse 36. Luke 2, 36. Simeon, full of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of prophecy guiding Simeon at the right time to give the right message, to give the witness that the people of Israel, even the priesthood, were not recognizing or discerning. And then another witness in verse 36, it says, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Aser. She was of great age. And had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And she coming in at that instance gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of, of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So you're talking about this prophetess, Anna, Anna who gets married, I don't know how old she was, a young, a young damsel, gets married, lives, with her, lives as a married woman for seven years. Seven years, her husband dies. And then for 84 years, she never remarries again. But instead marries the Lord and His work and serves God in the temple day and night with fasting and prayer. A woman of great age, well over a hundred another pioneer who was preserved to give testimony to the coming of Christ. Very interesting, Simeon and Anna. These two witnesses, these two prophets, these two pioneers that were preserved so that they could see Jesus come. And the Bible says she departed not out of the temple. And that's interesting. Go to Revelation chapter 3 with me. What does it mean to not depart out of the temple? You know we're told in inspiration that there are men and women living even now that are living well past the age of 80s and 90s that have the seal of God on them right now. These individuals are just, they're just going to receive the finishing touches of immortality. They're ripening for eternity. And they have the seal of God on them now. These aged pioneers, these faithful fathers and mothers in Israel. 
that God still has alive to preserve and to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And it says she did not depart out of the temple. What does that mean? In Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 10 it says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a what? Pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I'll write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So when you're made a pillar in the temple of God or the church of God, you don't go out. What does that mean when you're a pillar? Is a pillar something that moves? Does a pillar shake? A pillar is something that's solid. It's immovable. It's something that's settled. And in order for us to get the seal of God, we too must be settled like a pillar into the truth both intellectually and spiritually so that we can't be moved. And when that happens, what does God say He's going to do to those pillars that, go, that do not go out of His temple? I'm going to write upon Him what? How many names are mentioned here? How many names are mentioned? You tell me, how many names? Three. Does everyone see that? Name of my God, the Father. Name of New Jerusalem. And then my new name, Jesus' new name. Three names. A threefold seal as it were. By the way, how many names do we usually have on our birth certificate or our driver licenses? Passports? First name, middle name, surname? Is that correct? All right, so. Honor the prophetess is speaking to the people in Israel that are looking for redemption. Was everybody looking for redemption? Are we looking for redemption? To look for redemption. What does this mean as we come to an end? There's two points here. Please go to Luke 21 with me. As I'm bringing out these final points now. Looking for redemption. Redemption from what? Redemption from sin. Redemption from the bondage and corruption of this world. Luke 21, verse 24. Looking for redemption. Two points here. Luke 21, 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity to the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts felling them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your what? Redemption draw of nigh. All of those events that we described are prophetic events in nature. Those that are looking for redemption and understand that their redemption draws nigh, they're understanding and studying the events of prophecy, last day events, the signs of the times, understanding where we are in this world's history. That is a prerequisite for those that are looking for redemption. You're not looking for redemption or understanding that your redemption draw of nigh if we're, if we're ignoring the signs of the times. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble, which are clearly presented. The multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths as, as though they had never been revealed. That's, that's part one. 
But part two is in Titus. Go with me to Titus chapter 2. That's redemption A is understanding the events, understanding prophecy, understanding the signs of time. But is that enough for us to be redeemed? Even if your interpretation of the events are correct, is that enough to be saved? Not at all. It's been proven that a theoretical knowledge of the truth is insufficient to save the soul. It is essential to understand. It is essential. But by itself, it, it, it cannot save the soul. So Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to how many men? All men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in the world to come. In this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might do what? Redeem us from how much iniquity? All iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We need to understand the events of prophecy, latter day events, but we also need the work of the grace of God, the work of the Holy Spirit to teach us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, to deny all ungodliness and worldly lusts, to be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity. We can't be redeemed from all iniquity without understanding the work of grace and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we are redeemed from all iniquity, does that just mean we're forgiven of our sins? Does that mean we're just covered of our sins? Our sins are covered, our sins are pardoned? What is redemption? What is redemption? Because Christ bore our sins the first time. But when he comes back the second time, he's coming without sin unto salvation. And those that are looking for him also must be without sin. Because he's putting away sin now in the Holy of Holies. And we're sending our sins beforehand to judgment. That they might be what? Blood it out, Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44, and then I'm closing in Acts chapter 3. So Isaiah 44, and then Acts. Isaiah 44, verse 21. This, as we will find, is the difference between the everlasting gospel and all the other gospels. All the other gospels that are out there being preached talk about forgiveness. They talk about pardon. Pardon but they don't talk about the blotting out. The plan of salvation is more than just being pardoned. It's total restoration of the image of God and man and standing before God just as though you had never sinned. That's only done through the blotting out. This is what redemption is in the Bible. And this work was not finished at the cross. Christ did not blot out sin at the cross. At the cross, there was forgiveness provided and mercy and pardon provided, but the sins were not blotted out because that would take a priest in a heavenly sanctuary with the blood of the atoning sacrifice to do that. Isaiah 44, verse 21. Isaiah 44, 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel... For thou art my servant, I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have what? So wait a minute. When, when has God redeemed us? When our sins have been blotted out. 
Verse 23, Sing, O you heavens, for the Lord have done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. And when does Jacob become Israel? During the time of trouble. It's the night of wrestling. It's the final conflict. That's when Jacob becomes Israel. See, right now we are Jacob. And we're wrestling. We should be wrestling. And overcoming. But in order to be called Israel, you would have had to have overcome and had your sins blotted out to have a new name change. To receive the name of my God and the name of Jerusalem which cometh down from my God in heaven and my new name. Redemption is understood once sin has been blotted out. And therefore Acts chapter 3 says this. Let's close here in Acts chapter 3. This was not something that happened at the cross. This was not something that happened in Jesus' day. It didn't happen in the apostles' day either. They looked to it as something that would happen in the future. Notice in Acts chapter 3 as we're closing here. Christ came in person, His first advent, to begin this work of redemption. But when He comes back the second time, that work would have been done. It would have been completed. It is finished, as it were. It is finished for the final time. Each time Christ finishes something that's important to the work of salvation and redemption, it's finished. And then you come to another stage, it's finished. Then you come to the other, it is finished. Notice in Acts chapter 3 as we close here, verse 18, Acts 3.18. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all His prophets that Christ should suffer, He hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and He shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. We're in this time. We have to repent. We have to be converted. That our sins can be blotted out. Jesus cannot come until the time of restoration of all things. We're living in this time. And if we would be a part of that work and that event, the shepherds, the wise men, the prophets, are pointing us to the work that God's people do in these last days, within and without, to prepare the world for the greatest event that will exceed the birth of Christ, but will be His second coming in power and great glory. Our Father in heaven, we come to you today in Jesus' name, humbled, that you would send your son into the world to be born in a lowly manger in a stable for animals. No room in the end for the king of glory, the creator of the heavens and earth, the Holy One of Israel, had a lowly birth as he would come to do the work of redemption. And he had his witnesses that he employed to proclaim these glad tidings of good things. And today, that same work is being done again on a greater and larger scale. You've given us these three watchers as an example. Of the work that was taking place. The messages that were understood the circumstances that were transpiring in the church and in the world. 
And we're praying that we too could be looking for the blessed hope, looking for him to come the second time without sin and the salvation. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. He that hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing of the Lord in righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Pray, Father, that you will help us to engage in this work of having our sins blotted out. We're grateful and thankful that you have spared you have spared us another year. We're coming to the close of another year. And that you have not cut us down. That you are extending grace and mercy. You are giving time for the budding trees of spring to produce fruit. We don't want to take your mercy for granted. We don't want to say in our hearts, my Lord delayeth his coming. But we want to be those that are watching. Those that are waiting. Those that are working. For the building of the kingdom of Christ on earth. And to prepare the way for the bridegroom's coming. We're looking for redemption. We desire our sins to be blotted out. Not just for forgiven. We, we want that our conscience would, would have no more remembrance of the sins that we have committed against you. We want your law to be in our hearts and in our minds. And that we could be your people and that you would be our God. And that you will forgive us of our iniquity and remember our sins no more. As you give us a clean slate, as you give us a new white page, this coming new year we pray that by the blood of the Lamb you would help us to keep those pages clean. They will not be defiled. What sins in the past, but that our name could be retained. If it is your desire and if it's your prayer to look for redemption, to be redeemed from all iniquity, to be purified as a peculiar people and zealous of good works, to be partakers of the times of restitution of all things that we could receive Jesus and help others to be ready for his coming, then I just simply invite you to raise your hand where you are. Just to raise your hand as signifying, Lord, I desire to make this covenant. And I don't want it to be as ropes of sand. But I want to take hold of your hand. Take hold of your strength to make peace with you. He said that I will make peace with thee. Lord, we thank you for the blood that washes and cleanses. But we're also thankful for the blood that blots out. The blood that overcomes and it's our desire to be your shepherds to be your wise men and to be those that are following the spirit of prophecy in these last days thank you father in jesus name amen and amen